Hello, welcome to Prague Life. Today I'm joined by Sam Marsden. She's the author of a young adult novel, Under Glass, which just came out in the Czech Republic under the name Colony. Congratulations, Sam. Really exciting news. And I know that your novel has also been optioned for film and TV by the former Warner Brothers president of film. Really great news. So let's start a bit about talking about Under Glass. What is it about? Um, it is set on a colony on Mars and it follows Eva Knight and she is the daughter of the president on Mars and the president on Mars um, she's very very rational and people aren't allowed to feel feelings and everything's very kind of black and white and she wants everything to be for the greater good but Eva feels really trapped in this colony and she She's an artist at heart. She wants to do art and listen to music and she feels really restricted in this world. So it's about her journey of finding out who she is and, um, and it's a bigger journey as well for the colony on Mars um, because there's a lot of suffering and things that are happening up there that aren't really okay. Nice, and you know, Mars, very far away. How did you come up with that idea? To write that yeah yeah um well actually when I very first started the book it was set um in a futuristic earth and I put the colony in the middle of California um and that was the very very first draft of the book and then I thought I really wanted the kind of the suffocation and the feeling of feeling so trapped and disconnected from what it is to be human so I thought story-wise it really really worked to set it on Mars um, because Eva the main character's craving for human connection and connection with nature and connection with earth and I thought well if she didn't have those connections with nature and animals and what it is to be human down here it could be even more sterile up there on Mars and when I changed it to Mars just this whole story felt so much better. And yeah, and finally all came together, right? Uh, I found this quote and I thought I would love to get your insight on this. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. Do you feel like this quote represents the underglass? Yeah, I love that quote. And it's, it's really, really true. Um, I love books that have big picture themes, um, books that look at society and how we work you know, globally and as a group of people. Um, and yeah, big, big themes really appeal to me. So that quote does appeal to me for Underglass. And one of the main themes in Underglass is what does it mean to be human? Um, which is a really big question. <laughs> and I think it's a question that we all ask ourselves. So yeah, it definitely applies to Underglass. Colony, I should say, sorry. Colony, yeah, exactly. Well, both both work perfectly. Um, talking a bit about you, you have dyslexia, right? Do you feel like that ever became an obstacle for your writing aspirations? And should it be to anybody? Mm -hmm. So it's been a gift and it's been an obstacle. It's been both. Uh, I couldn't really read until I was about 14. Um, and I didn't read my first full novel until I was about 21, 22. Um, and it's only about now that I'm actually kind of an average level reader. Um, it, took, it took quite a long time to get there. Um, I think people with dyslexia often are really good storytellers. So Steven Spielberg has dyslexia, Agatha Christie has dyslexia. And when you have dyslexia, you have to be really good at problem solving and you have to be really good at seeing things in another way just to survive. Um, so, um, I mean, people with dyslexia have to do that from like the age of three years old. So in, I think under glass, you can see, like I'm quite a good storyteller in under glass. Like the, the scenes move quite fast. There's the story's good, but actually writing um, can be really hard. And it, I mean, everything I write is kind of spelt wrong and I have to use spell check a lot and I have to get a lot of people to proofread it. Um, and so it, in that way, it can be a curse. 
Yeah, and I imagine, you know, when you write a book, you write it, you write the first draft, and then you have to review it and do a second draft or a third draft or however you work. So that must be really challenging when it's you're yeah. having a hard time to read it through. It's, it, uh, it's an obstacle. I think when you have dyslexia, you just have to accept that it's going to take you a bit longer than most. Um, and Under Glass Colony went through five massive rewrites and edits. Um, and I think that's partly down to the, dys the dyslexia. But then also that's a good thing because, oh, I worked so long on it. I knew the characters so well. And I got to really, really feel and be in that world for a long time. Uh, yeah. Exactly. And maybe you having this issue kind of puts you in a different uh, kind of mindset when you're writing a book. It's, it's all, all just in your head. And, you know, it, it's always in your head, but especially when you have dyslexia and when you, you maybe don't reread it and it's all kind of this big world there. And it's, it, it can be a really good thing in a sense, right? Yeah, and I'm a really visual thinker. Um, as I wrote the novel, I saw it as a film because for me, that was the most exciting way to write. And I almost pretended that I was the director of the film. And I was like, okay, if I was the camera person right now, I'd scan across and then I'd zoom in on this actor. And I, and I think when you read the book, it, it, I've had a lot of people say it's very, very filmic. And I think that's why it got optioned for film and TV um, because it has a very filmic feel to it. And I think that's partly because of the dyslexia. You know, there are so many issues that writers can encounter when writing books. One of them is writer's block. How do you overcome it? Yeah, so I definitely get it. And normally it's insecurities about having dyslexia. And I say to myself, oh, I have dyslexia. What am I trying? Why am I trying to be a writer? Um, but there's lots of different things you can do. Sometimes I eat, which is really bad. <laughs> I'll like start baking and like, oh, maybe some biscuits will help. Maybe some sweets will help. I don't recommend that one. Um, <laughs> Maybe it would work, um, I would. <laughs> uh, journaling. So um, the moment I wake up in the morning, I will try and journal for about 30 minutes. And it's kind of that moment in between sleep and awake, um, which is the part of the brain you need to be in when you're writing anyway. And then unconscious thoughts come out and often bits of dialogue for a character will come out at that time or a poem about the world that I won't even use that poem in the novel but it will be there for me so yeah journaling and then music I love putting on uh, my huge headphones and I put them on and listen to really loud uh, film soundtracks so like Hans Zimmer and John Williams um, but it can't have words in the music if it has words in the music then I'll get all distracted and it takes away from my words so it has to be wordless music. Uh, I think when, when talking about books and generally the value that books bring the readers, it's that it reflects the reality and allows us to get better insights into the, better, uh, into the real world, right? What value do you think in this sense can dystopian, dystopian fiction bring? Uh, because it's, it's not real, right? It's, 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 it's fictional, it's made up. Uh, what kind of insights or, or, or value, as I said, can that bring to the readers? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I mean, I think a lot of value. Um, I think really good dystopian fiction shouldn't be telling you how to think. It should be encouraging you to ask the right questions and encouraging you to ask questions about what does your society look like and what does your government look like? And what do your rights look like? And how are you behaving? And what's your place in the world? And I think when dystopian fiction can get people questioning how they're living their life and how things are going in their world, that's when dystopian fiction is really good. And I personally really like to look at history um, because unfortunately history does repeat itself, um, but in different ways. <laughs> so for this book, I really looked at World War II and how did World War II start and how did that all unfold? And I looked at that, but then imagined what that would look like in a futuristic world with different technologies and with different... On Mars. A... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And to, to, to the writers, to all the people who write, uh, give us a few writing tips. Yeah. Um, 
one thing is just keep doing it. The more you do it, the better you will get. And there is no way anybody is good when they first start out. Like I know a lot of writers now, um, some who were quite successful and none of them were good when they started. It takes years. So you've just got to write, write, write and read, read, read and just do both of them for years. And then <laughs> one day you'll be, you'll have something. Also, I think it's really important to look at the real world. Um, I think, you know, following the news and reading nonfiction books and getting curious about the world that we live in so that you have something interesting and, and of value to write and live just like, you know, every experience that you live can be useful to you for your fiction. Exactly. I, I also agree. I think it's all about the experiences and how we share them through books or through video or for anything else. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Sam. And I would like to congratulate you one more time on your very exciting achievements. And I hope that you will bring us many more great books to read. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so much. much. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, guys, please give us a like, subscribe and uh, check out Sam's book. It just came out in the Czech Republic. Have a great day and bye.